Happy Easter. Easter. We're going to be in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. For all those of you who are new here, I'm Pastor Ryan, and I'm glad you're here today. And uh, it's good to be with your family, friends, and I just pray you have a great day celebrating the resurrected Savior. And uh, if you're new here, I like to preach through the Word, and And so you'll see me stop sometimes and teach it as we go. So just hang on to your place in the scripture. I'll do my best to also hang in and make sure I don't lose my own place because I have before. First Corinthians chapter five, verse one, we're in a scripture where the apostle Paul is uh, having to make sure people understand that there really was a resurrection, a bodily resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so he goes into a little defense, giving an argument for how we know this to be true. And just so you're aware as well that this author of this, this letter was a persecutor of the church. He was overseeing the death of the disciple, uh, the follower of Christ, Stephen, in Acts chapter seven. So he actually uh, was trying to persecute Christians for their faith in Jesus. He wanted them dead, and he approved the death of Stephen. But Jesus got a hold of him also, praise the Lord. Jesus showed up to him and changed his life. And now instead of fighting against God, he fights alongside God for the gospel. How many of you know, how many of you have been changed by Jesus? You know what I'm saying. That Jesus can change anyone. Amen. So, He wants to remind them of the gospel. And you can't talk about the gospel without the resurrection of Jesus. The gospel is not complete without the resurrection of Jesus. How important is Easter morning and the resurrection of Jesus? Well, Lexham's survey of theology says this, the resurrection of Jesus Christ validates his identity as the divine son of God demonstrates his irrevocable victory over death and the grave and secures both the present salvation and future physical resurrection of believers. So that's pretty important. The resurrection proves that he is the son of God. The resurrection demonstrates his irrevocable victory and power over sin and death. And the resurrection secures both our salvation and our future physical resurrection of all believers. You know, Jesus is coming back, my friends, and it's not long. He's not, com- he's not going to take long. He's coming back. The earth is groaning for his return right now. The signs are showing. If you've been struggling to believe, today is the time. If you've been struggling to surrender to Jesus and give him your life, today is the day. Because when, when he comes and he takes us to be with him, it's going to be too late, my friends. We need to be ready now. And I pray that today's message will, will get your attention if you do not have Christ as your Lord and Savior. This is what Paul says in, in verse 1 of chapter 15. So 1 Corinthians 15, 1. And he's talking to his church, the church that he's helped establish in Corinth, the church of Jesus Christ. He says, let me now remind you, dear brothers and sisters, of the good news, the gospel I preached to you before. You welcomed it then, and you will stand firm in it. It is this good news that saves you if you continue to believe the message I told you. Unless, of course, you believe something that was never true in the first place. So we know that they have believed in Jesus Christ for salvation. And he's saying that if you divert from believing in the resurrection of Christ, the bodily resurrection of Jesus and the saints, then you are no longer standing in that salvation. You have stepped outside of it. But if you continue to believe it, then you are safe. You are saved. Now, verse three says, I pass on to you what was most important and what had also been passed on to me. So he didn't invent the gospel. He didn't invent this message. It was passed on to him. It was passed on through the Old Testament scriptures. It was passed on through Jesus himself. And this is the gospel, you ready? If you ever needed to know what it is in a nutshell, here it is. Christ died for our sins. Yep, 
We're sinners. We're sinners. We could not be holy enough to get to heaven. Our debt was so large, it was so much debt, the, the, the lack of holiness and the ability to live holy was so bad that the only person who could pay for our debt of sin, the only person who could live a sinless, holy life was Jesus Christ himself. And Christ died so that you could be in heaven and have everlasting life. So you could be forgiven of your sins. Just as the scripture said, he says, he was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day. That is the gospel. Jesus really died. And they made sure he died because they put a, a spear in his side to make sure he died. And you don't bury someone who's alive and put him in a tomb, but they did. You know why? Because he died. But that's not the end. And I'm saying that on purpose because skeptics say he never died. That's the swoon theory. He just, whoop, he wasn't really dead yet and then they, they pulled him out of the grave and hit him. Okay, no, he died. He was buried, he was raised from the dead on the third day. That's the good news. He died, but he didn't stay there. Death could not hold him. So it goes on to say this. He was buried, he was raised from the dead on the third day, just as the scripture said. Now, I don't know about you, but that's the way we need to live. We need to live based on what scripture says, not what we say. When it comes to all matters of life, amen. When it comes to all matters of life and faith, what does the scripture say, not what does Ryan say, Pastor Ryan, not what I say, what you say, what does the scriptures say? Well, we need to look at what he was considering. So when Paul's thinking of the scriptures, he's only thinking of the Old Testament scriptures at this time because the books of the Bible of the New Testament were not written down yet at this time, believe it or not. This was such an early time after his resurrection that the gospels had not been printed yet. So Paul is looking at Old Testament scriptures going, these scriptures prophesied that this would take place. And he's thinking of Isaiah 53, five through six, but he was pierced for our rebellion, crushed for our sins. He was beaten so we could be whole. He was whipped so we could be healed. All of us like sheep have strayed away. We have left God's path to follow our own. Yet the Lord laid on him, on Jesus, the sins of us all. That was prophesied almost a thousand years before Jesus was crucified. Isaiah 53, nine, he had done no wrong and had never deceived anyone, but he was buried like a criminal because he was crucified between two criminals and he was put in a rich man's grave. We later find out in the New Testament that's Joseph of Arimathea. So hundreds of years before, I'm sorry, it's hundreds of years before in Isaiah. Now a thousand years before is Psalm 16, nine through 11. The king, David, says these words, prophesying of Jesus. No wonder my heart is glad and I rejoice. You know, we're supposed to have joy because someone's alive, Jesus is alive, right? He says, my body rests in safety. So I even have peace because I know Jesus is alive. Verse 10, for you will not leave my soul among the dead or allow your holy one, Jesus, that's who he's talking about, to rot in the grave. You won't let my soul Stay among the dead or allow your holy one to rot in the grave. You will show me the way of life. Did Jesus show us the way or what? Granting me the joy of your presence and the pleasures of living with you forever. Wow. These, these are just three scriptures from the Old Testament that Paul would have in mind that this is what the scriptures say was going to happen and it did happen. So let's go on to the next portion of scripture. We see here that Paul uh, invokes eyewitnesses to help prove that this happened. So we're gonna be in verse five. He was seen by Peter. Everyone know who Peter is, right? The one who denied Jesus three times. Jesus made sure he showed up for him because he was so distraught at what he did. Jesus in his kindness made sure he showed up to Peter to let him know, I still love you, brother. I forgive you. Now serve me. Okay, so he shows up to Peter and then he shows up to the 12 and that's the title for all those who were his closest followers from the beginning. 
After that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Now, if you, if you go to court and you have one eyewitness, that's pretty hefty. How about 500 eyewitnesses at the same time saw Jesus alive? Do you think that's enough? Now, he says here, most of them are still alive. So if you have any questions, you can go hang out in Galilee and start talking to all of them if you want. He's alive. They're gonna tell you the same thing I'm telling you. So if you are struggling, go ahead and go start questioning these 500 witnesses, the ones that are alive. Now today, people will say, well, they were all delusional all at the same time. Okay, I've never heard that before. Doctors, psychologists, and scientists say that's impossible for 500 people to have a vision or delusion at the same time. So I don't know if that's really a great evidence against the resurrection of Christ. And if that's not enough, how about the next one? In verse seven, then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. Why James? James is the half-brother of Jesus who is a skeptic of Jesus. So even Jesus, or even uh, uh, James, Jesus' brother, saw that he was alive and changed, and we have the book of James because of that, okay? Last of all, this is Paul, last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. For I am the least of all the apostles. In fact, I'm not even worthy to be called an apostle after the way I persecuted God's church. So here we are, we have the man who persecuted the church and now he is saying, I saw him for myself. You know what's really interesting about that though? He was blinded literally for three days in order to see Jesus. Ironic. He was blinded physically so he could believe with his heart spiritually. And then he got his vision back. And Paul, arguably, because one book we question whether he wrote Hebrews or not, has written 13 books of the New Testament. So that makes sense why he would say this. Verse 10, but whatever I am now, it is all because God poured out his special favor on me. Whatever I am now, it's because of his grace is what he's saying. And not without results, for I have worked harder than any of the other apostles, yet it was not I, but God who was working through me by his grace. So it makes no difference whether I preach or they preach, for we all preach the same message you have already believed. So why did he say all that? Because of verse 12. But tell me this, since we preach that Christ rose from the dead, why are some of you saying there will be no resurrection of the dead? And then he goes into this long list of consequences if there's no resurrection of the dead, okay? Here's the consequences. For if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised, then all our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. And we apostles would all be lying about God, for we have said that God raised Christ from the grave. But that can't be true if there is no resurrection of the dead. And if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ has not been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then your faith is useless and you are still guilty of your sins. In that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are more to be pitied than anyone in the world. That sounds pretty bad, doesn't it? Let me give you just five things that he's referring here to. Number one, this will be on the slide for you as well. If there was no resurrection of Christ, the claims of Jesus are not true. And they would be false witnesses and false prophets, false teachers. Jesus claimed these words, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. That's what Jesus said. Now it baffled all the Pharisees and the teachers. They didn't know what he was saying. They thought he meant the physical temple, brick and mortar. He was talking about himself. Later on, when Jesus rose again, the disciples realized he was talking about himself. What about when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead? In John 11, 25 through 26, he's talking to Lazarus' sister, Martha, and he proclaims this, I am the resurrection and life. I am the resurrection and life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. That's life after death. 
okay? Thank the Lord for that. All family members and friends who are believers in Christ, they have life after death. So if you've lost loved ones already and they've gone to be with God, they're doing really good right now. Then he goes on to say this, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. What is he referring to there? He's pointing to when he comes back and the saints that are still alive, if they will live with faith, they will never physically die. They'll just transfer from this life to the next in a blink of an eye. How is this possible? Because Jesus is the resurrection and life. Praise the Lord. <clears throat> so if this if, if the resurrection of Christ didn't happen, then these claims of Jesus are true. And I dare not say what that means about Jesus because he is telling the truth. He's not lying, right? But that's what people will say. But he proves it at the tomb when it's empty. He proves that he is the resurrection of life. Number two, if there was no resurrection of Christ, then there's no salvation from sin and death. We are still lost in our sins. And all those who've died before us are dead. Death won in their life if the resurrection never happened. See how bad this is? If Jesus had not been raised from the dead, then sin defeated Jesus and death has become the victor, but that's not what the good news says. We would still be guilty of our sins and have eternal death. It would be inevitable. Number three, if there was no resurrection of Christ, Paul's saying then, your faith is useless because who do you believe in? Where does your faith go? There's nothing to land on with your faith. There's nothing to hope for in the next life. Sounds pretty grim, doesn't it? What's the point of believing for something next coming in the future? What's the point of believing that anything can change? If Jesus stayed dead, then everything in my life must stay dead then. Nothing could ever change in my life. Nothing could ever improve for the better. So why would I have faith to believe in something better for me, my family, or the future? Death is the end then, the final destination if Jesus didn't rise again. Number four, if there was no resurrection of Christ, the ministry of the gospel is useless. Why am I up here right now? Why would I be here? Paul goes on to say the same thing. Everything I've done for the gospel is a waste of time. He, he was beaten. He was shipwrecked many times. He was whipped. He was betrayed by fellow believers. All of that, he's saying, would be a waste of time. There's no point for the apostles to preach. There's no point for me to preach the gospel, the good news. There's no point for any of us to tell people the good news because there is no good news. It's just all bad news. That's if the resurrection didn't happen. If, everyone say if. Okay, just making sure we know. <laughs> everything that you've gone through for the gospel's sake, every time you've been persecuted, every night you stayed up late to study the Bible, to share with people around you, every prayer you prayed, wasted. Imagine that. What kind of life is that? It's a hopeless life. Lastly, if there was no resurrection of Christ, there is no hope for life after death. That's it. Six feet under, you're done. That's it. And this is what people believe. This is what people think. That there is no creator that made life and then came down himself in Christ and paid the penalty for your sin and my sin so that you could live forever. People believe that. Now people go, why do you believe what you believe? Because I know, because he lives inside of me. Because I know, because he's changed lives around me. That's why. We can go back and forth on that all day. The reality is there is no hope after this life. There is no hope, it's just death. And to deny the resurrection of Christ is to remove the good from the good news. It's just bad news. A denial of the resurrection tears the heart out of the gospel message and leaves it lifeless. So this is, uh, this is like the moment where you go, okay, Paul, now can we turn it positive here? And like a deep sigh of relief, we get to read verse 20. <laughs> you ready? 
But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. In the beginning, I asked the question, how important is the resurrection? My own personal observation, the doctrine of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is essential in keeping all the other Christian doctrines alive. If Jesus didn't rise again, then none of the other teachings of Christ matter. Isn't that kind of crazy? If you have a coat hanger at home and you go to put your jacket on it, it holds up that jacket, right? If there's no coat hanger, that jacket falls. Same thing with Christianity. If the resurrection isn't true, Christianity crumbles. There's nothing else to believe in. The resurrection of Christ keeps all other doctrines alive. But in fact, he has risen from the grave. Now, it'd be cool if he put the witnesses part in the, in the after that part. Like, that would have been nice, right? Like, hey, let me tell you how many people know. 500 people, this, this. But let me tell you something real quick. I'm gonna go off my notes a little bit here. Hang on, everyone buckle up. But in fact, he did come back to life. Let's take in consideration a little bit more evidence of the witnesses. On Saturday, they were hiding in homes. True story. Hiding in homes, afraid and in despair because Jesus had died. This is the, his early followers. And Mary, the women, all the women, they're hiding and they're depressed and they're sad. We can call it Saturday. S-A-D-E-D-E-R-D-A-Y. Saturday. It was sad. It was silent. You might have heard that. We have the evidence that Mary and other women were going to the tomb to anoint his body. They went and purchased burial spices, a custom. If someone's dead, they go and they go anoint the body. They let them in to do that after a few days to anoint the body, to keep it as fresh as long, to preserve it. So Mary and them didn't even believe that Jesus was gone or alive. They thought he was gonna be there. Now, that's evidence that Christianity is true, that the resurrection is true. Because even Jesus Christ's uh, own followers were also questioning whether he was telling the truth or not. They go there and they don't find, the, find him. Instead, they find an angel saying, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He has risen. Now, Peter did deny Jesus three times and he was in despair. But then in Acts chapter two, about 40 days later, after the crucifixion, Peter is preaching courageously to over 3,000 people and they give their life to Jesus Christ. A person who was hiding and felt bad for denying Jesus is now preaching the gospel. The church exploded in Acts. Something happened in between. You following me here? It's because Sunday came and Jesus rose again. And so did everyone's spirits. And so did hope, and so did joy, and so did peace, so did love, so did the gospel. Something changed. This is what happens because of it. In verse 20, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of a great harvest of all who have died. So verse 21. So you see, everyone all right back there, poor guy? Aw, oh, it's okay. I was yelling, I'm sorry. I was getting loud. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. Just as everyone dies because we all belong to Adam, everyone who belongs to Christ will be given new life. So just as everyone dies because of Adam's sin, we have new life because Jesus died for our sin. Praise the Lord for that. Amen. Amen. He goes on to give a little evidence of how we know this is true. 
Verse 23, but there is an order to this resurrection. Christ was raised as the first of the harvest, then all who belong to Christ will be raised when he comes back. That's the first fruits principle. So at harvest, they would gather the first fruits of the harvest and bring it in as an offering. And Jesus is the first fruits of what's gonna take place, a pledge, a guarantee, a foretaste of what is to come in the future. And Jesus is the first fruits of a resurrected body, the resurrection, and everyone following him that are believers will also rise again when he comes back. So he's a deposit. He is a foretaste, just the first fruit offering. Then later on, they would harvest the rest. But right now, it was just Jesus. The rest will be all of us, and it would be our physical bodies. So everyone who's passed away, their bodies will be resurrected and given new bodies, eternal bodies. Paul goes in to say that. Right now, their souls have already left because souls aren't gonna stay in the ground, just so you know. So you're wondering, are they with God? Yes, their soul is with God, but their body will be resurrected, okay? And they will become one again. And thank God for brand new bodies. I can't wait. I can't wait. Oh, glory, hallelujah. Lord knows I need one. Under construction still. Oh, man. What, are we, what is Paul saying here? Well, first of all, to get a little bit more on the cross, uh, the cross is the payment for our sin. The resurrection is our receipt. The cross paid for your sin. The resurrection proves that it worked. Proves that it's been paid for. And Paul's saying, if you believe in that, you will have new life now, and you'll have even greater life in eternity, in the future. So what is Jesus doing in this scripture What is he saying here? He is inviting us. What is Paul saying? And what is Jesus' life doing? Paul is saying we've been invited into the resurrected life. We don't have to live in the grave any longer. So let me help us apply this to our lives because church, the resurrection happened. Are we living like it though? Unbelievers, those who are still seeking God, those who are searching, the resurrected happened. You have yet to see how good life can be. How awesome, and not, not easy, but full of hope, full of joy, full of peace. Because he lives, number one, because he lives, there is freedom from sin. In fact, he did rise again. Therefore, we're not still in our sins, we're forgiven. We've been taken out of that old life and put into that new life when we believe in Jesus Christ. We have been resurrected from our old man into our new man, our new person. When we believe in Jesus Christ, it's not just an intellectual belief. You are believing that you are in Christ. You are covered by his blood, covered by his grace, and you have a new identity. You are a new creation. It's like, yes, praise the Lord. You're, you're not saying, I, I, yeah, I believe he exists. That's not what belief is in the Bible. Belief was a turning away of your old life and turning to follow Jesus and live a new life. It was abandoning your old ways and putting yourself in the new path of Jesus Christ. It's like taking yourself out of here and, and you didn't do it, Jesus did it for you. When you believe, he transferred you into his marvelous, marvelous light. He transferred you into a new creation. You are a new person through faith and you must continue to believe it. You must continue to believe that your old person has died, your new person has come alive and it's only by the power of Jesus Christ. You gotta believe in it too. You gotta believe that to be true. And this is what scripture says. 1 Peter 2, verse 24. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed. So in other words, sin, you're dead to me now. Uh, you, some of you have said that to people. Whoa. You're dead to me. Let's say it to sin. You're dead to me, sin. 
You're dead to me. I'm not gonna respond to what you want me to do. I'm gonna respond to what Christ wants me to do. That's to give up your old life and put on your new man, your new life and live righteous instead of living unrighteous. Okay, now Ryan, I can't do that on my own power. I'm so glad you said that, you're right. You can't. Now Romans 6.10 says this, when he died, he died once to break the power of sin. Just one time. That's all it took Jesus to break all the power of sin in our lives one time. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So you also should consider yourselves, this is on the screen, verse 11, Romans 6, 10 through 11. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and alive to God through Christ Jesus. Let's try Romans 8, 2. And because you belong to him, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. And that's not a good death, that's a bad death. That's eternal death, not eternal life. Sin leads to that death. But we don't have to live that way. You see, death couldn't hold Jesus. Hell couldn't stop him so that you could have resurrected life so that you can live forever, so that I could live forever. <laughs> Jesus invites you to not be bogged down and bound by sin any longer. He invites you to be free from that sin and have everlasting life. So why are we stuck in it too much? Let's not be, church. Let's live like the resurrection happened. For you who are not believers yet, I want you to know something. The power of Jesus Christ in your life can break any stronghold, any addiction, any shame from your past, any wrongdoing. It can be forgiven and paid, it's been paid for and forgiven if you believe it. That is the hope of Jesus Christ and his cross and resurrection. And then he doesn't just say, imitate me. He doesn't just mean follow me. He's the incarnational Jesus Christ, who lives with you and in you, enabling you to resist sin, resist the control of it, so you're no longer slaves to sin, but now you're free in Jesus Christ. But you can't do that on your own. I, trust, I've been there. There is nothing, no sin could I overcome by my own power. I had to ask for God's strength, his spiritual power that he has given to me through faith, and that's the only way I broke through bondages in my life. That's the only way I overcome. That's the only way I remain strong in the Lord and stand strong in the Lord is through his help. So my call to you in this moment is get out of the graveyard. That was your old life, my friends. Do not go back to it. He has died and rose again so you would live a brand new life that is beautiful. Secondly, because he lives, death is defeated. I'm gonna move quickly here so the band can come out because we're gonna sing and worship him. Uh, yeah, we're gonna sing because he lives, just so you know. Yeah, we are. That's an old song we all love. <laughs> Can't title the sermon without singing it. Because he lives, death is defeated. 1 Corinthians 15 Pastor Ari already said it, verse 54 through 57. Then, when our dying bodies have been transformed into new bodies that will never die, that's what I was talking about earlier, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death, and the law gives sin its power. But thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. Hey, as long as you're not in this place and you're standing in this place, you have death over sin or you have power over sin and death right now through Jesus Christ. It's the only way you receive it is by standing in Christ. You have victory over sin and death. By believing and trusting Jesus with your life, do you have that? And it's an ongoing thing in life to continue in that and to hold on to him. Despair, gloom, fear, and dread. Those are all real emotions, right? 
Those are all really emotions that we, emotions that we go through. If any of you were at the Christiana Mall last night, which some of you were, because I know I prayed for a couple today, you're feeling fear and dreading emotion, right? It was scary. And for good reason. I don't know if you're aware, but there was a shooting at Christiana Mall last night. Those are real emotions. Fear of a lot of things in our lives. A lot of dread, a lot of gloom. But let me tell you something. We don't have to live that way. It doesn't have to dominate our hearts and our minds. Persecution of the church. Trials that are gonna come. Trials that are gonna come on Christians more and more around the world, they already have around the world. We can face the blade, we can face the persecution, we can face evil doings in our world. As scary as it will, we can still be at peace, a peace that surpasses all understanding, scripture says, because we know Jesus Christ is the resurrected life and he's given us resurrected life. I can sleep at night knowing if I close my eyes on that pillow and I don't wake up, I'm gonna be with Jesus. That's not what everyone else offers in this world. Amen. But it's not just about when you die, it's about right now. Because of that, we can have joy, we can have peace, courage, and hope. These were all evident changes in the followers of Christ after he appeared to them. He is our living hope. We don't have to fear death or the future, we don't have to fear tomorrow. We can face trials in life with faith that all things work out for the good of those who love him. Amen. And lastly, the gospel lives on. Because he lives, the gospel lives on. Let me land the plane here. Paul said this in verse 58. My, if you ever get a card or a letter or a note from my dad, you're gonna read this. Pastor Kuhn will send you this, this scripture. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. He ends this discussion on the resurrection, which we didn't fully cover. And remember when I said that he would say, he said that if the resurrection didn't happen, all of his work was useless, it was in vain, it was a waste of time. Well, he, he has an answer for that. For, for all the apostles, all the preachers, all the disciples, even you and I, he says this, because of the resurrection happened, therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Don't stop doing, in other words. Stand firm in what you've been doing. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Now, there, there's an important catch to this. Work of the Lord, not works of the flesh. Not works of the sinful nature. Work for the Lord. Do what the Lord wants you to do. Preach the gospel. Tell people about Jesus. Plant some seeds. Throw the seed out of the gospel. Love your enemies. Love those who persecute you. Pray for them. Stay up late at night instead of watching TV, Netflix, Amazon Prime, every single other, Hulu, you know. Good grief, there's a lot of options. But there's only one option that brings life forever that no matter what you do, no matter how much you know, you spend time on other things. This one thing, the labor in it will not be in vain, and that's the word of God. Staying up late, yes. Staying up late, or getting up early in the morning, or reading throughout the day, the word of the Lord, letting his word work on you so you can do the work of the Lord for him. That will not be in vain. All the prayers you prayed for your neighbors, all the prayers for your kids, all the prayers for your own life are not in vain. God hears them because he's alive. Jesus cares. Jesus knows what you're going through. The gospel lives on. You know what that means? Things can still change in your life. The resurrection means that something that looks like it's dead doesn't have to be. It can come back to life. If it's a marriage, if it's a friendship, a relationship, if it's a trial, if it's a conflict, if it's a sickness, whatever it may be, God can turn it around, my friends. Nothing is too dead for him. Nothing is too far gone for him. I don't care how much you've sinned. 
I don't care how bad you feel about it, how ashamed you feel about it, he's still saying I love you and while I'm not there yet, this is the time to believe in me and be resurrected and have a new life. This is the time because when I come back, it will be too late. When I come back, I'm gonna be gathering up the church. It's time now. In church, all the work we're doing here in Dover, Delaware and beyond, all the churches that are preaching the gospel, that Christ died, he rose again, it's not in vain. This is going to work. We're going to experience resurrected life now and in the future. Would you believe it today? Romans 1.16 says this, for I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Today, if you need to believe in the gospel, let's close our eyes as we call you to trust in him. You're not gonna have to leave your seat. You can stay right where you are. We will be down here at the, at the end if you need prayer for anything or if you wanna confirm this prayer with us. But today, Lord, I just pray you would work right now. There's so many ways I could apply this. There's so many ways I could connect the dot, Lord. I, I pray, Lord. Today, Lord, if they have felt like they could never be saved or they've been stuck in despair because of their sin, because of their shame, God, I pray that they would trust in you for forgiveness of sin. Any doubts, Lord, I pray that your spirit would con convince them today that you are real, that you are knocking on their hearts right now, the door of their hearts. Lord, I pray that they would let you in. If that's you right now, will you just repeat this prayer after me? Dear Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins. Thank you for rising again to give me eternal life. I believe I'm forgiven. I believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And I believe you give me eternal life. I will follow you. Give me your spirit to live free from sin and the fear of death. Give me your spirit to help me live for you and the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Let's give God glory and praise for those who prayed that. We thank you, Lord. Thank you, God. If you prayed, with us in that moment from your heart. We wanna know, so we wanna help you out. We can also pray with you and talk to you afterwards down here in the front. There are blue cards in your pews that you can fill out and leave for us. We wanna send you some resources to help you with your journey. There's free Bibles in the pews, you can grab them. If you want, those Bibles are free. Even if you didn't pray today, grab a Bible if you need one. Church, I don't, how, why don't we stand and sing these songs? as a declaration that we believe, and all those who just became our family members in Christ, we believe Jesus is alive. And because he lives, we can face tomorrow. Amen. God, we thank you, Lord. Lord, be glorified as we sing these songs to you. In Jesus' name, amen.